The NWSL has reportedly signed a new collective bargaining agreement with its players, while a USL soccer team is moving into a Major League Baseball stadium. Plus, we'll hit some news out of the NFL and some final stories from the Olympics. It's Tuesday, August 13th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Pass rusher Hassan Reddick, who was acquired by the New York Jets during this offseason, has already requested a trade to a new team. Reddick is in the midst of a contract holdout, with reports indicating that he's looking for a new deal around $28 million per season, compared to the $15 million he's owed next year. Jets GM Joe Douglas responded to the reported trade request swiftly, saying that, We have informed Hassan we will not trade him. We have been clear, direct, and consistent with our position. LA Sparks guard Dierica Hamby is filing a lawsuit against the WNBA and her former team, the Las Vegas Aces, for reported discrimination. Hamby's attorneys allege that following her informing the team of her pregnancy in late 2022, coach Becky Hammond leveled a series of false accusations, criticized her pregnancy, and even questioned her commitment to the team. She was traded to the Sparks shortly after. Hamby had filed her complaint in 2023 and was just granted the right to sue. Logan Paul's Prime, a drink brand created by the influencer in 2018, has been hit with a $68 million lawsuit for reneging on a manufacturing deal with bottler Refresco Beverages. Refresco says that Prime failed to buy a minimum of 18.5 million cases per year, a number they contractually agreed to with the bottling company in April of 2023. Refresco says they spent considerable time and money to retrofit its equipment to exclusively accommodate Prime's unique bottle shape. The NWSL reportedly reached an agreement on a new CBA with its players' union. This will be only the second CBA in the league's history. The first one covered 2022 to 2026 and introduced free agency, boosted minimum salaries, and provided housing and transportation for players. This one will be the first since the league signed a new set of media deals that took its national annual media revenue from $1.5 million to $60 million. The league and its players are expected to announce the deal later this month. Nearly three years after Aaron Rodgers gave his famous immunized quote, the QB says he regrets misleading people about his COVID-19 vaccination status. Rodgers told author Ian O'Connor, If there's one thing I wish I could have gone different, it's that because that's the only thing critics could hit me with. In 2020, the future Hall of Famer said that he was allergic to ingredients in each of the vaccine options, which is why he had to sit out for 10 days as an unvaccinated player after contracting the virus. If he could do it again, Roger tells O'Connor, I would have said, F the appeal, I'm not going to be vaxxed. The NWSL and its Players Association have reportedly come to terms on a new collective bargaining agreement. This will mark the first such pact since the league signed its transformative media rights deals. My colleague David Rumsey joins us next to break down what we know so far. Joining me now is Front Office Sports newsletter writer David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. The NWSL has reportedly reached a new CBA agreement with its players union. League and players have not reported this themselves, but we're getting multiple credible reports that this has happened. What do we know so far? Right. So the current NWSL CBA collective bargaining agreement runs through the 2026 season. It began in 2022 and it was actually the first CBA in league history. So they're getting this deal done early this time, as it look, looks like about two years ahead of time. Um, we don't know a lot of details yet about uh, if salaries are going to increase or benefits are going to increase for players. But what this would do for the league is really set itself up for a solid future running through potentially the end of this decade where the players and the owners don't have to worry about any kind of labor strife. Yeah. And, you know, this is a big four years that the NWSL is in right now because they just signed their new media deal. They went from one and a half million dollars annually to 60 million dollars annually. So what I'm going to be watching out for is what the players are getting from the new hall. Right. Of course. So these, as you mentioned, these new media rights deals, they're going to run through 2027. So if this new CBA was starting after this one ends in 2026, then it'd be going into the next media rights deal, which you would think would be even bigger than this four year, $240 million deal. And I think what's interesting as we talk about player salaries right now, we have seen some explosion of growth for some top NWSL stars, some multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts, but that's not the norm. The average NWSL salary is something in the range of roughly $56,000 this season. And the the minimum salary is $35,000 for an NWSL player. So if they get uh, more media money during this contract into the next one, will that new CBA, what will the average and the minimum salary be there? Because that's really what's going to impact the most amount of people. Right. And 
you know, when the players negotiate these deals, often sure. there's the raw numbers, like how much money are we going to get? Uh, and then there's things like travel and accommodations. I think for this, the the headline, uh, I will assume is going to be those big headline numbers, like salary cap, minimum salary. Um, but as we get sort of start to get the details right. here, anything else that you're going to be watching out for? Yeah, I think it's just interesting drawing some parallels between the NWSL and the WNBA to really, you know, on the up, trending up women's leagues, uh, new media rights deals recently for both of them. And I think the, the players and the people representing the players are really fighting right now to make sure that their value is, um, you know, seen and, and heard and that they're getting what they think they deserve. So they want as much media money as they can get. They want to make sure they get a fair share of that because it, that's what it really comes down to, right? How much are the players going to get paid? The things that you mentioned, whether it's uh, the issue around charter flights in the WNBA or, you know, it could be the same thing, how teams travel and the NWSL, um, other benefits. And both these leagues are expanding too, right? The NWSL and WNBA both want to get up to around 16 teams this decade if they can. So that's a good thing because that means more games, more TV inventory, but sometimes that's more players to take care of. So some players could push it the other way and say, hey, take care of us before we bring in a whole new crop of uh, athletes. But I, I think it's interesting to watch both of those leagues kind of trend, trend up as women's sports continues its momentum in the U.S. Yeah, and I'll be wondering if this deal contemplates the next media deal, which, as you mentioned, this one runs through 2027. The CBA presumably starts in 2027, though I guess provisions of it could come in earlier than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, whatever the next deal is, I wonder if it's going to contemplate that next media deal of, you know, we get X percent of the media money. It's, it's right. going to be interesting to see. You would hope and think from a NWSL player perspective that they're setting themselves up for a proper share of just overall league revenue into that next uh, CBA. Like I said, we don't have terms yet, so we'll see what that actually looks like. But yeah, absolutely. It's it, The thing is, it, it's key to have a long-term collective bargaining agreement in place when you're going into media rights negotiations because you want to be able to tell, from the league perspective, you want to be able to tell your broadcast partners, hey, we're locked up through X amount of years, whether it's the NWSL or whether it's uh, the WNBA or the NFL or NBA, whatever. You want to be able to say, hey, we're not going to have a strike, a lockout. You know, you're not going to be searching for TV inventory when inventory when you, you know, we promised you X amount of games. So that's definitely going to be key because as revolutionary as these uh, $60 million annual deals are for the NWSL with their current media partners, they're going to be coming up quick. Uh, you know, this is the, this is the first season, obviously, but it's only a four year contract. So it's going to be coming up quicker than we realize. And I think it's just key to make sure that the league and the players are on the same page as they start looking ahead for their next phase of growth. Yeah, absolutely. The last thing I wanted to ask you, and this is a little out of left field for all of us, we got a report today from a 16-year-old writer named Callum Ewing for a site focused on the Atlanta United called Scarves and Spikes that MLS is planning to launch its own women's league that would presumably compete with the NWSL in 2027 following the 2026 Men's World Cup in this country. Does any part of this pass the smell test for you? It, it would be pretty crazy if it, MLS tried to pull something like this off, in my opinion. Now, we like this, there's no other real big details. Would it be a competing league against the N N NWSL, kind of like the USL Super League is doing, but on a different calendar? Or would it be a developmental league? I, I don't know. You have a, a, a few cases of MLS owners, um, particularly in uh, Houston and Salt Lake, who also own NWSL teams. So that doesn't really seem like great business. So, I, you know, I, I'll, keep, I'll keep watching that, but... Yeah, it'd be very interesting if that actually went came to pass. Right. And yeah, I said it competes with NWSL because the report said that this would not be the NWSL. Of course. Um, so maybe it yeah. would make sense as a lower level league, a developmental league, something like that. But we need more details for this to start making sense because right now it kind of doesn't. Right. And I guess if we're, you know, putting our tinfoil hats on and just kind of looking at some historical precedent, the, the MLS does have, you know, the MLS Next Pro, which is kind of a lower tier league that competes with um, the, the USL, which is kind of that second division of professional men's soccer in the US. So, so MLS is not afraid to kind of push the boundaries a little bit 
Um, but there's, you know, the NWSL is already so, so established as we're talking about here. So always appreciate the insights, David Rumsey. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks, Owen. The Oakland Roots of the United Soccer League will play their home games in the Oakland Coliseum, which the Oakland A's are vacating for Sacramento after this year. I spoke with Roots president Lindsey Behrens about what this deal means for the franchise and how they might be part of the Coliseum site beyond next year as ownership of the site shifts to the African American Sports and Entertainment Group. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Lindsey Behrens, president of the Oakland Roots and Oakland Soul. Welcome, Lindsey. Thank you. How excited to be here. Yeah, great to have you on. So the Oakland Roots will be playing at the Oakland Coliseum uh, in 2025. What's this going to mean for the organization? Well, the Oakland Roots are very excited to be at the Coliseum in 2025. We have had a nomadic existence for the first few years, and that led us to Cal State East Bay and Hayward, which has been an incredible host to us. Uh, we have really, really appreciated them letting us play there. But the goal has always been to return to Oakland so that we could have our team play here. And the Coliseum is, you know, a historic legacy that means so much to the community and so many incredible sporting events have taken place there that it's really an honor to be able to bring pro soccer to Oakland and to the Coliseum and to continue the legacy of pro sports in that space. I know that this was close to being announced back, I think in March or April. Um, I think at the time there were still negotiations going on with the Oakland days uh, who obviously, you know, ended up, going to Sacramento for, you know, the next few seasons. Um, what, what was that kind of the, the source of the delay for this announcement? No, they made that decision a few months ago. It has just been a, you know, it's just been a business negotiation back and forth and a lot of things to iron out, uh, including the installation of a professional football pitch into the Coliseum. And those things just take time. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And yeah, speaking of the Coliseum, I mean, of course, it's one of the most maligned uh, venues in Major League Baseball. How are you going to address those concerns as you guys move in? Maligned, but also beloved. You know, I mean, I think that the Coliseum has a lot of charm, a lot of character, a lot of history, and Oaklanders really love it. And we're excited to be there. And we are plan to make it our own. Our footprint there will be about 16,000. Uh, the seats for fans will be located on the lower level of the west side. And we have plans for, you know, putting things around the field like we do at our games currently and having a club space uh, to, uh, to give some premium options with food and beverage. So I think that people are going to have a great time there, just like they do at our games currently. Our whole goal will be to keep the good community, family-friendly, exciting, fun, Oakland personality that our team has carried with it to Hayward and bring it to the Coliseum. Uh, I know you're also the president of the the women's team, the Oakland Soul. Um, I know they're not coming to the Coliseum in 2025, at least that's not the plan right now. Any chance that, you know, they, they could be brought into this, the, to the same venue? So Oakland Soul is currently in a league that plays during the summer. When Oakland Soul is able to go pro, they will be in a league called the Super League that is kicking off actually in just a few days. And that league starts playing in August and goes through to December, then takes a winter break and then resumes in February and goes through June. So it's very exciting because we will have professional soccer in Oakland year round and there won't be very many markets that are able to make that claim. But in order for Seoul to go pro, we just need absolute certainty around our venue in 2026. And we don't have that quite yet. Uh, our agreement to play at the Coliseum is for one year. And we are continuing to work on our Malibu proposal. That's the modular stadium we would build next door to the Coliseum at a lot that used to be the home to the Malibu Grand Prix. That's why it's called that. Um, and we're on schedule for that to res to be built and to start hosting games early in 2026. And so once we have that home, we'll be able to promote Seoul to being fully professional. 
The African American Sports and Entertainment Group are in the process of taking full ownership of the Coliseum site. What does that potentially mean for on your end and, you know, potentially staying at that site long term? It is wonderful news for Oakland that AASEG has contracts to acquire both the city and the county's half of the Coliseum. And once ownership of that entire facility is consolidated with AASEG, it opens up so many different opportunities, um, including potentially an extension of the Coliseum itself, um, but also the opportunity to build a permanent stadium in Oakland. The Malibu site has always been a temporary fix. Uh, our contract that we've been negotiating with the city and the county is for a term of 10 years. The idea was that we would build a modular stadium there, and that would be the bridge so that we could work on a permanent purpose-built soccer stadium in Oakland. And that could be uh, within the larger Coliseum footprint. So we are very, very excited for AASEG to be taking over the Coliseum and c excited to continue working with them. We have a great working relationship, including a cooperation agreement for our stadium at the Malibu site. So we think that's great news and it's so overdue for redevelopment of the Coliseum site. And it's awesome that it's a group of people with roots in East Oakland that have a uh, figured out how to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And when you say, you know, a custom built soccer stadium on the Coliseum site, I mean, that site obviously includes the Coliseum itself, it includes a giant parking lot. Um, like, where, where are we talking about? I mean, like, would this be um, in addition to the Coliseum, taking the place of the Coliseum? Um, yeah, to talk to me about what would actually be going on with that purpose built site? Well, the opportunities are endless. And uh, I, we wouldn't be the ones in charge of the redevelopment plans. Um, that would be AACG and their partners. Um, we're one of which, but uh, would be many additional, many additional people would have input into those decisions. But it could be any of those options that you listed and many more. So there's going to be a lot of activity on that site. So many things that can be developed to bring jobs and economic development to that community. And we're just really, really excited that's finally happening. Yeah. And along those lines, you know, Oakland is in the middle of this, you know, metamorphosis, shall we say, in terms of its its sports profile. I mean, obviously, the, the A's are on their way out. The Warriors went to San Francisco. The Raiders a while back at this point went to Las Vegas. But there's, you know, the the roots and the soul, I think, have inherited a lot of that Oakland love. I've been to one roots game and it, it feels like, you know, like A's games used to, honestly. Uh, the ballers are also inheriting a lot of that. Um how do you see kind of the, the next generation of Oakland sports? Oakland is an incredible sports town and it has a, you know, a really rich legacy of having amazing teams here. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of those teams have also exited the market and we are just so proud to be able to inherit the fans and the tradition and the dedication and the loyalty that comes with being an Oakland sports team. You know, this community is really strong and it's very resilient. It's had to be. And I think there's a really bright future for Oakland. Um, we just need to get through the rough patch that we're in right now. And, and yeah, do you see other, you know, potential collaborations with AASEG? Um, you know, obviously the the site itself and having a stadium there is is front and center. But um, I'm just wondering if you've got other opportunities in mind in terms of how, how those your two organizations might collaborate. Well, we've been working together now for many months, and I think there are a lot of future opportunities to work together as well. You know, they only just got um, these term sheets signed with the city and the A's to acquire these two parts of the the real estate there. And I think there's just a lot of work to be done. Um, so I do think that the opportunities are endless, but what exactly those look like, uh, there's a lot of decisions and work to be done before deciding those things. Makes a lot of sense. Well, very exciting stuff. Lindsay Behrens, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. The Noah Lyles Team USA beef was thrust back into the spotlight over this weekend with Lyles eventually walking back some of his earlier comments. 
In 2023, Lyles famously criticized the world champion moniker given the title-winning American sports team, suggesting that players should have to beat the best worldwide, not just in the US. After officially becoming the fastest person in the world at these Olympic Games, Lyles now, in the mold of many NBA players, wants his own sneaker deal. In June, Time released an article that detailed how Lyles was invited to an event for Anthony Edwards' Adidas shoe release. Lyles' feelings on it were direct. He said, You want me to what? Invite me to an event for a man who has not even been to an NBA Finals in a sport that you don't even care about, and you're giving him a shoe? All I'm asking is, how could you not see that for me? Edwards' USA teammate Devin Booker noted the statement was out of context, but outrage boomed after Anthony Edwards won a gold medal, and fans dug up the quote from Lyles. Lyles responded directly to the backlash, saying, There is a rumor going around that it did not go to Anthony Edwards' shoe release because he didn't deserve it. That is not the case. He definitely deserves his shoes. He's an amazing player. The problem was finding time based on my prior engagements. Kay Adams stoked the fire a bit on Monday, asking Dolphins wide receiver Tyreek Hill about Lyles' world champ comments. Hill responded, saying, Noah Lyles can't say nothing after what just happened to him. They want to come out and pretend like he's sick. Come on, bruh, just speak on what you know about, and that's track. Adams immediately jumped in, asking if he would want to race Lyles when the gold medalist returned home. Hill jumped right in. I would beat Noah Lyles in a race. He repeated multiple times. It probably won't ever happen, but fun to think about. The US and China both earned 40 gold medals at the Olympics. Chinese state media celebrated the achievement, but some in the world's most populous country are claiming that the country actually earned 44 gold medals because they should be able to count those from Hong Kong and Chinese Taipei. Both have an ambiguous relationship with China due to their semi-autonomous status. The medal count isn't the only area where the two countries have clashed. U.S. anti-doping officials have made noise about 23 Chinese swimmers being allowed to participate in the Tokyo Games following positive tests for a banned substance. Chinese officials seem to reference that in congratulating its athletes, saying, you insisted on winning moral, stylish, and clean gold medals. The U.S. won the overall medal count, winning the most silver and bronzes with 44 and 42. The Olympics have wrapped and athletes are looking to capitalize on their 15 minutes of fame and evolving personal brands. But for track stars, there may be a new path into the mainstream. FOS Editor-in-Chief Dan Roberts sat down with former Notre Dame and UCF quarterback Brandon Wimbush to discuss his journey with athlete brand development and how it led him to a track league that features, quote, the best of the best. Let's listen to that conversation now. Okay, Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio, and we've got Brandon Wimbush, former Notre Dame and UCF quarterback, who now has an interesting track business launching soon. Brandon, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Dan. I appreciate so, it. So I want to talk about Duel. That's the company that, that you've joined, that you've just announced, yep. and we'll get into the model there. But let's kind of start at the beginning. We'll go all the way back to college. Yeah. Uh, I remember watching you play Notre Dame, the, then UCF, and now figuring out a lot of interesting things you're doing in business. If you go back to when you were playing, how did you approach this question? How were you thinking about your life after college? Did not play in the NFL. What did you think was going to be next for you versus what you ended up getting into? It's funny because you're never a four-star quarterback recruit coming out of uh, northern New Jersey, playing at one of the most premier divisions in all of high school sports, winning a state championship, beating people like Jabril Peppers and Rayshon Gary. And then going on to Notre Dame, and obviously your mindset is that you're going to start for you know however many years, and then go on to play on Sundays, right? Um, that's the ultimate goal, obviously, and then to get an education alongside that. Um, I took that very seriously, obviously, considering Notre Dame, and I was I was uh, considering Stanford and, and Miami. So education was definitely important to me. But playing on Sundays was is the ultimate goal of every athlete playing at the collegiate level, especially Division One. Um, but again, taking into account, I went to a school like Notre Dame, I was able to leverage everything that it had to offer to me, um, and understand that football was going to end eventually, right? And people like Justin Tuck, Corey Robinson, um, David Robinson's son, um, and so many more were kind of, you know, ideal models for me to to understand that football was going to end and there was something that was going to come after it and so again i, I was super grateful for notre dame and under, helping me understand that i was going to have to have a life after football and was able to prepare during my four years at notre dame for that and that's where i'm at now i'm leveraging all of those relationships um, and uh, resources that i was able to build yeah let's talk about how the landscape has changed because i, I think now uh, players are thinking about either 
post game that applies to guys who are in the pros. Uh, it applies to college players. They're thinking about their post game and, and off the field life much, much earlier, yep. from what I can tell. I mean, that's been a trend for 10 years now, but then enter NIL, name, image, and likeness, and, and allowing these players to actually make business deals while they're still playing. Right. All of this stuff has changed dramatically, rapidly, uh, but what do you make of all this? I mean, you launched a business, Mogul, M-O-G-L, that was a platform for NIL, so yep. you were, were quick to uh, jump on what you knew was gonna be a huge, huge area. Yeah. Yeah, I think for us it was, okay, we understand athletes want to make money, and that's the number one reason they're going to want to use our marketplace to connect to brands for sponsorships and endorsement opportunities. But for me as a former athlete, it was how can we help and assist athletes in uh, understanding that there was going to be life after sport and understanding that name, image, and likeness and the opportunities that were going to come for them um, they could leverage and use more than just making money and connecting to sponsorships, right? It was career development, right? It was communication skills, it was time management skills, it was professional development, connecting with CEOs, CMOs of businesses and startups that really wanted to leverage, you know, their, ath their name, image, and likeness. Um, and to really maximize those four years um, for a lot of athletes now going, coming through name, image, and likeness um, and understanding that uh, you know, there's there's more to get out of it than just sponsorship revenue. Mm. You did not have NIL when you were playing, obviously. Unfortunately not. I missed it by one year. Oh. Uh, but again, back to the four-star recruit, I think I would have been uh, pretty well off and uh, would have been, you know, blessed coming out of coming out of college. When you look back on that now, is it is it at all frustrating? I mean, yeah. I just always think of guys who were penalized for signing autographs, little things like that. And yeah. Now that wouldn't be an issue at all. And right. does it seem you know unfair in that regard? It's a little bit unfair, but like those guys had to go through what they had to go through to get to this point, right? And obviously we've seen the House versus uh, the NCAA settlement, right, where there's going to be $2.8 billion in back pay. And now we just had a conversation around um, 20% of, of, of the bottom line uh, yeah. revenue for athletic departments being dispersed among uh, the entire athletic student body um, in a revenue sharing model, right, which is to come and which, you know, speak 10 years ago, this is like we never would have seen today. And so athletes are better for people like myself who went through it, people like my good friend Arike Ngumbawale who was at the peak stardom and didn't get to earn anything, right? Two national, you know, champion. Two national, huge buzzer beaters. Two huge buzzer beaters, Ed O'Bannon from uh, mm -hmm. uh, UCLA and, and so many other names that come before, um, you know, 2021, which is when NIL went into effect. So um, there always has to be a precedent and um, I'm grateful that I've been able to, to have a, uh, a part in, um, in, in athletes' journeys through NIL now. Yeah, huge sea change. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Duel. Yeah. which you have joined this company, hasn't yet launched uh, the first event, but right. just explain what, what the model is here for this company. Yeah, Dan, so track and field um, has been pretty overwhelming, right? Uh, you can kind of see it through the Olympics. I think it's a little bit more um, siloed in the Olympics because uh, all of the biggest names are taking part in it. Um, but in between every four years, there's so many events. There's 400 annual meets um, across the world in track and field. So fans really have a hard time engaging with the sport, following athletes, right? Building storylines with the sport. I mean, so that's what we want to create. Uh, we want to create an opportunity for these athletes to really continue to be in the spotlight between those four years of every Olympics. Um, and so the way we're going to do that is by duels format, right? We're going to reimagine the format of track and field. And so duels are going to consist of head to head running tournaments. Uh, single elimination brackets, um, only going to be the 100 meter and the mile, right? Wow. As track and field's marquee events. Um, and so it's going to be eight women, eight men going head to head uh, in, in, in these March Madness style brackets. Uh, we're going to crown one winner in each bracket um, with an ultimate grand prize of $500,000. Um, so super exciting, obviously coming off, you know, the heels of Paris, and then looking forward to Olympics uh, in LA in 2028. Um, the, the space, the sport is so primed, right? And it's right now that, that this investment is needed and the change is needed for, for these athletes. March 2025 is the first race. Yep. 
is that for now the one we're doing or is this going to be a schedule per year like yeah. how many times a year are you going to gather people yeah um, will you do it circuits like it's in this city and then we're going to come to this city yeah hosting is hosting you know uh, the way we're looking at it right as a business hosting fees is going to be a big revenue driver for us eventually um but Everything is built for broadcast, right? This is going to be a product built for Smart. for modern media, modern fan, and for and for broadcast. Um, it's you know the the event that's going to happen in March is going to be the inaugural Duo 100 meter. Um, each event is going to be its own separate discipline. Um, so we'll introduce the mile in fall of 2025, um, and then ultimately uh, we'll culminate. Uh, 2028 and have five events per year by the time 2028 Olympics comes around. Um, uh, so, you know, next year we'll have three events. It'll be the March Dual 100. We'll introduce a flex event. So whatever event is super popular um, during that time, we'll introduce that. And then in the fall uh, in Jamaica, we'll have the Dual 100. So um, really excited about what's to come in, in, in this regard smart uh, about having a media deal, you know, designing this for broadcast so that people can see it, think about eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, who can you get to race in these things? Do you expect that it's actually yeah. runners who are hoping to make the Olympics? Is this college runners who are now just keeping up with it but aren't pro? We want the best. We want the best of the best. Um, that's what this is for. Uh, that's the only way we're going to be able to land these types of media deals that you know, the ESPNs or the, you know, the, the college sports or the NBAs are, are, are demanding. Um, and so we want to be on that level. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is having the premier names in the world of track and field. Um, and we feel, give, we, we feel really uh, comfortable and confident with our relationships that we're able to go get some of the names that you're seeing out there in the Olympics this year uh, being able to compete, right? And I think, again, Dan, you, you look at the overall investment and demand in the space of track and field from Michael Johnson, Alexis Ohanian. Mm -hmm. um, the prize pool, right? Track and field athletes are not making a lot of money. Right. And you can compare it to NIL, right? It's like only brand building endorsement deals, right? If you're the top athlete. Um, so with our $500,000 prize pool, we, we expect and we, you know, we're, we're excited that we're able to offer this type of prize pool. And so, and then 35.4 on Saturday to watch Gabby Thomas in the semifinals and then people like Simone Biles, right? So. Uh, that's for the Olympics, but I think for track and field, we think about obviously like guys like Usain Bolt kind of drove numbers. But since Tokyo 2021, um, all the viewership numbers from NBC have has since have since doubled. Um, you know, unequivalent days. Now, granted, that's the Olympics. Yeah, granted, that's the Olympics, right? Um, but I think again, when you have the the names, the premier names. Um, and it's a different format, right? That's the other thing I wanted to call out, right? It's the head-to-head -head format. And when you think about one-on-one -on -one level of entertainment, you think about UFC, you think about power slap, um, and the way that these sports, right, have kind of been able to, to reignite what entertainment looks like. And so 10-second sprints, Dan, are gonna be organically created for social media. And that's where a majority of social uh, sports content is being consumed these days. And so with this product being a product built for broadcast and media, we expect to create storylines. It's going to be a different product that's going to be out, right, for, for track fans, new and old. Yeah. Um, and so that's where we expect the demand um, and the eyes, you know, continue to roll from, you know, the, the we're using the excitement from the Olympics. 35 million viewers, they want to see... Noah, they want to see Shakari, they want to see, get, you know, they want to see these athletes run again. And so we're going to give that we're going to give them that on a on a different and a unique uh, platform. Yeah, the head-to-head -head model is is a really cool part of it. Looking yeah. forward, is this replicable for other events, yeah. either field events? You know, you're starting with just the hundred and the mile. Can you eventually down the line do this for for other races and for maybe field events? Other races, other sports, um, but yeah, again, right, introducing a flex event. So if it's uh, if it's the long jump that's super popular, right, going into the, the summer of next year, we're going to maybe introduce that and show that, right, dual in the same March Madness bracket, single elimination style format. Um, if it's the triple jump, if it's the, um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it might be, if it's the javelin, right, um, we have the ability to really replicate this format and, and bring it to any event within track and field. Uh, and then, you know, you continue to expand to, uh, uh, new demographics, whether it's another sport, 
Um, whether you're you're bringing in NFL players like DK Metcalf and Tyreek Hill to go run, very cool. You know, it, uh, you know this has been done before, right? World's fastest man, and you've seen Usain Bolt. You've seen other people do this one on one, but nobody's actually produced a business out of this. Awesome. Yeah. Good. We'll be watching. Thank you, Dan. Wish I you appreciate luck. you guys for having me, as always. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, share an episode with a friend or drop us a rating or review wherever you like to listen. If you're on YouTube, throw us a like and make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.